Aloha Aina, Ano Ai, Valina Kako. Welcome to Free Hawaii News, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation, presenting Hawaiian perspectives on a broad range of topics and issues affecting the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific, and the world. Your hosts for Free Hawaii News are Leon Kaulahau Siu, musician, composer, diplomat, and political analyst, and Hina Le Moana Wong. Kumuhula, filmmaker, cultural and Hawaiian language preservationist, and community leader. And now, Free Hawaii News. Aloha nui. Ano ai me ke aloha i akakoa pauloa e kohawa i nei pai aina puni o wauno keia o kumuhina. We are here welcoming you to this new episode of Free Hawaii News. Mahalo for joining us. Over the last several weeks, we have witnessed additional appointments by Governor Josh Green to lead several departments of the state of Hawaii government. More than a few of his selections have been met with disappointment, anger, and resistance on social media by Hawaiians. Specifically, those departments that directly affect Hawaiians, such as the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and the Board of Land and Natural Resources. To find out why Kanaka are upset about these selections by Governor Green, we now go to Hawaiian activist Healani Sonora Pali to learn more. Aloha Healani. Aloha uh, Kumuhina and Aloha Leon. Wonderful to see you again. Can you explain to us why so many Hawaiians are upset about some of Governor Josh Green's appointments? Josh Green, our new governor, has not been paying attention and listening to the people of Hawaii with a lot of his appointments. Uh, he needs to appoint people based on their qualifications and not on their relationship to him. There are a few good ones that he's, he's done, uh, like Laura Kaku at DLNR, great um, appointment. But then when you look at what's happening with the ATHL, that's very problematic what's going on there. It seems like there's a giant disconnect between his administration and Hawaiians. Why? With Governor Green, I feel that he has not surrounded himself with um, the people who are have been engaged in the community um, in a positive way, and so I, I you know, and I'm I, maybe it's because Governor Green wants you know wants to try something different and bring in new people but really you need people who can just hit the ground running and with some of his appointments not all with some of his appointments um either they're not qualified or they come with tons of baggage and when the baggage becomes an obstacle to getting things done then you know that appointment is not going to be good for our people, for our Lahui and for the Kanaka Maoli people. So when you look at now his new um, appointment, the new person he put forward for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, Kali Watson, yes, he's built homes. Yes, he has all this experience, but the baggage this guy brings to the department will bring so much controversy. It will make the department um, um, it, it'll make it, it won't help the department. Let's just put it that way. It will. It would be an obstacle to getting things done. Um, you know, he has. The last time he was in charge of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, you know, there was a homesteader on Kauai that burnt his own home and um, ended up passing away um, because they were trying. He said he was trying to evict him, and then. You have um, all of these accusations coming out now about um, how much money his nonprofit really made off of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands um, leases that he got and why he didn't pay his rent on time. When you bring that much baggage with you into um, a department that is probably the most important department right now, that now has to spend $600 million, you know, by 2025, then, you know, 
this is this is like a really bad choice. It's clear it's a bad choice. There are other qualified candidates. We have so many educated Kanaka Maoli out there. We have so many um, people who have the experience, who have the know-how, who have the degrees, who have been working in the community that can do the job. Uh, we don't have to keep bringing these and re recycling these guys, you know, to be these Im important departments that will is supposed to be housing our people. Um, we, we shouldn't, we have to stop recycling these people um, and let them just, let, let them rest and bring in new people with the experience. And there are so much people that are experienced within the department and also outside in the community. Uh, these some of his appointments are absolutely clueless on what's going on in the community. How hard would it be for Josh Green's administration to find Hawaiians to meet with and get their views? When you look at the way that our Ali'i ruled and um, you know when they came into power, when they when they ascended the throne, look at our last Ali'i, our last Mo'iwahine, Queen Ali'i when she ascended the throne, the first thing she did was she toured the islands and spoke with the people to find out what, what's going on. And, you know, we really, when it comes to Hawaii, we're such a unique, special place. You know, we are hundreds of miles away from the nearest continental um, areas. And, you know, we're pretty isolated. And so when... Josh Green comes into office. <laughs> the one of the first things he should have done is actually toward toward the islands and looked at the communities and spoken with community leaders. Um, when you are being advised, um, I mean it, it's it's obvious with all of the with all of the news and all of the controversy around his appointments that he's not being advised well. And whoever's advising him on, on this, on the appointments especially, is not doing a good job. But I, I have to say that the, you know, there are good appointments as well. I'm not saying that all of them are bad, but the, the important ones like DHHL. And then you have um, uh, another controversial appointment at the Department of Land and Natural Resources with Don Chang. Um, and I have nothing against her and I, um, just wanted to say that she, you know, th th there's actually a petition against her already from the community, not from me. But, you know, so these are the things that are real distractions to getting the work done. Um, but then I will say that his deputy director appointment, Laura Kaku, is just awesome. I mean, she, she's, she belongs there. She's well qualified. So, you know, there's, there's a, there's some good ones, but the important ones, the ones leading the departments are um, are controversial and may hamper progress moving forward. Are Hawaiians available and ready to meet with Governor Josh Green to give him their manao? Hawaiians are totally ready um, that a lot of us are just tired of the same old. Um, it's, it's like new people, but the same old uh, business as usual where nothing gets done and things seem to be getting worse. We, we need to stop prioritizing um, corporations and tourism and the military. We need to start prioritizing our, our people, you know, Kanaka Maoli and our residents and, and, and start, the government really needs to work for us. And I think that's what people are really tired of right now. And, um, I think if Josh Green would just reach out to Hawaiians and Hawaiian leaders, everyone would be more than happy to give him, um, to give him their perspective on what they see going on in the communities. Because it's super important to really have that connection, to have that line direct to the community to understand what's really going on on the ground. I think one of the most important issues is our Ibi Kupuna and uh, the protection of our, our traditional Hawaiian burials. 
development is out of control in Hawaii. It's absolutely out of control. Um, and because of this, and because of global warming and the rising sea levels, we have more and more bones being uncovered and desecrated along the shorelines uh, with huge developments going, still going on. And I think with Ivi Kupuna, it's, it's, it's the front line of, of where Hawaiians are at, basically. We are, um, we are the ones putting our necks out to protect our EV and to make sure that our kupuna stay in the ground um, because desecration is, is a crime, but nobody's, there, there are no um, consequences for developers, um, for builders, for anyone who desecrates a traditional Hawaiian grave, EV kupuna. So, um, you know, that is really a huge thing for us right now. I think that's one of the most important issues as well as our water and protecting that. Um, we need the military to get out already. And um, they are the biggest threat right now to people here in Hawaii. It's not China, it's the US military. They're threatening our lives by poisoning our water. And they already poisoned 93,000 residents on Oahu. Um, and they are dragging their feet, defueling those tanks. There's so, still 100 million gallons of fuel sitting above our aquifer. And um, there's 1,300 um, gallons of AFFF uh, firefighting foam that is that has um, concentrated PFAS, cancer-causing ch chemicals in them that they spilled um, and they never cleaned up well. Why do you think that administration after administration at the state level in Hawaii have always ended up avoiding talking with the maka'ainana, uh, everyday Hawaiians, about the critical issues that affect their everyday lives and ohana? I think it's two things. I think, number one, they're afraid of us. They have this very um, racist and derogatory view of our people. And they believe that if they come out in the community, we're not going to treat them with aloha. Well, look at what happened on the Mauna. And Kapu Aloha is pretty much how we move as Lafui today. Um, and I think, and we've never been violent, never been um, in, in 130 years since the overthrow. We have been peacefully protesting for the most part. And um, you know, we people have a derogatory view of Kanaka Maoli. The other reason is that the state holds two million acres of our land, stolen Hawaiian Kingdom Crown and government lands. And so it benefits off of our oppression. So it may not be in the best interest of these governors to come and talk to us and see what our real and true needs are, which is basically the return of our lands to our people. It's not in their interest to do that um, because they haven't been really paying rent to our people. We, uh, they pay 20% to another state agency called the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, but they don't pay rent. Um, these lands are being used not um, for not just schools, parks, and government, but and free of rent now, they don't pay any rent, but it's also being used for business and to um, support industries like the tourist industry. And it's also being occupied and destroyed by the US military. So part of the, so, and those are the two reasons, basically, they have a really bad view of Hawaiians and they really probably don't care what we think. Um, and then the second is that the state actually benefits off of our oppression and off of our lands, off of our labor, off of our culture, off of our intellectual property. You know, we have been exploited to the hilt as a people, as a culture, as a Lahui. What do you think it will take for them to listen to us? So I think we're just gonna have to keep the pressure on and we're gonna have to keep speaking up and we're gonna have to keep writing things down and giving testimony for the record, it's been 130 years of um, of so much going on, you know, 
and and our people survived. Our people went from like forty thousand to now we're like nearing a million, I believe. Um, in terms of numbers, we have recovered the population collapse, and we have um, brought back a lot of our traditions and and uh, ways of knowing, and we have. Um, we have uh, reoccupied our lands. We are uh, reclaiming our identity and our knowledge and our, um, and basically not, a lot of our people are not afraid to speak out. So I, and I think it'll be, I think Hawaiians would just say, you know, we, we, we really need, we need to get out of this system. I think most Hawaiians are there I think Hawaiians would, would demand a way forward towards self-determination and sovereignty for our people because we cannot continue to work in this system that actually oppresses us and actually benefits off of it and has been playing games with our people for 130 years. You know, it's been our people that brought our language back. It's our people that brought our traditions back. No one did it for us. And we can do it for ourselves in terms of nationhood. We, we can determine our own political, cultural, and economic future. And we should be given that opportunity. And I think Hawaiians, if they split with Governor Green, they would tell him that. They would say, we're done. We're done with the state of Hawaii. We're done with the United States and the U.S. military. We need, to, we need a way forward towards self-determination, self-governance, and sovereignty. And not a way, and and not the way that the, the state directs us. It it has to come from our people. It needs to come from us. We've done it ourselves. We've saved our language. We've saved our culture. We, we recovered our population. We did it ourselves. No one did it for us. Mahalo mihalani for your manao in, on this topic, and we just uh, want to thank you for all of that you do in every day for for the Lahui. So mahalo nui loa of particular interest at this current point for the island of Maui. We are seeing several issues that have to deal with luxury boats and this is causing a stir in the community. Luxury boats grounded on the reefs off Maui is once again in the news. The luxury yacht Nakoa was stuck on the reef for weeks at Honolulu Bay recently. As a result, 120 coral colonies spanning over 20,000 square feet were damaged. This is both a Hawaiian cultural issue as well as an ecological disaster that is raising concerns and tensions with Maui residents alike. Many say not enough is being done to protect Maui's shoreline as well as to prepare for storms. Recently, two more boats have broken from their moorings and one is now leaking fuel. Island residents say it's a long time problem. The Lahaina community is upset with boats that continue to get grounded on the reefs. One has leaked diesel fuel on the reef at Mala, which is where Hawaiians go to harvest limu, or as we say in English, seaweed. The reef at Mala is a major food source for Hawaiians and for our diet. The Lahaina community has been complaining for well over a decade about beached boats. And every time there's a storm with Kona winds, more boats end up on the shoreline damaging reefs in the process and either fuel or antifreeze ending up spilling and poisoning the reefs. Island residents of Maui say they have contacted Department of Land and Natural Resources officials numerous times in the past about this issue, but that DLNR has not taken any action. This issue is an easy fix and totally preventable. For me, whenever I hear about the name and the island of Maui, my ears perk up as I and many of you out there in the community, we have mo'oku auha, we have genealogical ties to the island of Maui, and 
especially for me there on the west side. And so we at Free Hawaii News will be watching closely what takes place and how these situations are going to be mitigated. So Leon, um, tell me your thoughts. Uh, you've seen this uh, play out in the news and you've seen the boats. They are stuck there on the reef areas. Uh, Mm -hmm. What are your sentiments? Of course, uh, Lahaina is the, the old whaling uh, capital of the world at one time. And uh, it's always had problems with boats that come in and, and do harm in the area. So back in the eight, uh, 19th century, when whaling was at its peak, there were hundreds of whale, whalers that anchored off Lahaina. And of course, they ran havoc over the islands uh, when they came ashore. And so this has been uh, a big problem ever since. So now, even though there are no whalers there, we still have boats uh, being destructive in, in many ways. Now, a lot of them are, of course, people who don't mean to be destructive. And, and they have uh, you know, anchored there thinking that this is a nice, safe place to anchor their boats and, and to enjoy Maui and things like that. But at the same time, uh, it is causing damage and destruction. So something really needs to be done to manage that properly so that boats do not come loose and start and destroy the, the, the reefs. And so that there's some sense of order and some sense of responsibility uh, to take care of things there in Lahaina. So uh, this is a very, very yes. long standing problem. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I would add to this that this is why it's extremely important to have Kanaka. And, and if not Kanaka, uh, we need to have those whom are astute in understanding our cultural values and our cultural views and concepts. So that way we can ensure that maintenance of as as people in politics refer to it as land and natural resources, but as we speak about it from the perspective of Kanaka, this is Papahanaumoku. Mm -hmm. Another name synonymous with Papahanaumoku is Haumea. And this is why mm -hmm. we must have regard for the land as well as the ocean, for they represent our makua. When we care for the land and the sea, it will in turn provide for us. Yes. And, and so it's extremely important that people who get into politics understand Kanaka views. Mm -hmm. So clearly we need more Kanaka to be engaged, um, but I do know that there are some non-Kanaka who have availed themselves to the body of Hawaiian knowledge, language and culture. And so what's most important is that the ike, the knowledge and this understanding prevails. So all those of you out there in our viewership, if you're not contributing to some of the issues and to, you know, to ensure that Hawaii remains a Hawaiian place, well, there's food for thought for all of you. On every episode of Free Hawaii News, I share a little bit about what's going on at the United Nations. So today's topic is on decolonization. And before anybody gets overexcited, let me explain to you how that refers to us. Uh, as you know, uh, Hawaii has, was never colonized, but yet it was. And so I'm going to be explaining a little bit, a little bit about what, how that came about. But before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on at the United Nations. Over the last 30 years, uh, there's been really a lot of attention being paid or attention being raised, started to be raised, and then developed at the United Nations regarding indigenous peoples. Now, back in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s, uh, people like uh, Russell Means, Antonio Gonzalez, Clyde Betancourt, uh, and many others from the uh, American Indian movement started to approach uh, the United Nations to, to develop a voice there. Others who were with them were Lenny Foster, uh, Willie Littlechild from, from Canada, Kenneth Deer from Canada, Charmaine White from the Lakota, uh, excuse me, Charmaine Whiteface from the Lakota, Andrea Carmen from Alaska, 
uh, Sharon Venn from Canada and Ron Barnes from, uh, from Alaska. Now, one of the prominent people who was there with them was our friend Kawai Puna Prejean from Hawaii. And let me just kind of tell you a little bit of story about how they started out doing this. Basically, in communicating with one another, indigenous peoples felt that they needed to approach the human rights bodies of the UN to get some kind of platform so that human, uh, so that indigenous peoples could speak to the United Nations and bring forward their uh, international concerns about how they're being treated. So, um, Kauai Puna and uh, Russell Means and all of them would descend on certain human rights meetings going on in Geneva. And of course, it was, uh, they had no real uh, funding and they had no real uh, support for that. So it was really kind of a, uh, they would go there and camp out. They would go find friends there who would put them up and stay at people's houses and all that. And then every once in a while, Kawai Puna would go out into the street, play his guitar, collect some money, and they would go buy food. You know, so this was a very grassroots effort of getting the attention of the United Nations. And it grew from there. Yeah, the United Nations became more, became more aware of indigenous issues. And then they started to actually pay more attention and to actually create some bodies in which they could listen to the complaints and, and the, the reports of what was going on among indigenous peoples as well as the, the North and South uh, North Americans, the South Americans joined in, as well as people from uh, Africa and from Asia. And so this movement began to really grow. And as a result, they began to meet at the United Nations um, to, in order to uh, define the rights of indigenous peoples. And some of the other contributors besides Kawai Puna Prejean, uh, people who came in later as they were formal uh, organizations being formed at the United Nations. Some of our other friends who were there were Poka Lainui um, and Mililani Trask, Bumpy, Bumpy Kanahele, uh, Kekula Bray who, from Maui. Uh, so all of these people were there contributing with the rest of the indigenous peoples to define what was going on among indi indigenous peoples and to create a platform and, and some kind of uh, a way that they could interact with the United Nations. And the United Nations was becoming quite receptive to that. And in fact, they appointed uh, as a special rapporteur, a man named Miguel Alphonse Martinez, who issued, uh, who, uh, who studied this issue, visited many, many countries and places, visited peoples in their villages, and came out with a report. And the report that he, he created created, actually set the, the pace for what was to happen later, which was a formal uh, document to be drafted on the rights of, of indigenous peoples. So that document was about 20 years in the making. And again, people like uh, Emiliani Trask and Foka Lainui and others contributed quite significantly to the drafting of those uh, indigenous peoples' rights. Uh, and eventually, in 2002, um, excuse me, in 2007, the, uh, the de Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations. So now they became an actual uh, part of the United Nations and, and an or a, a part was formed called the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And so for 20 years, this forum has been meeting annually at the United Nations Thousands of representatives from around the world, indigenous peoples, come to that to talk about what was going on in their places and to remind the United Nations and the countries of the United Nations of their responsibility to indigenous peoples. In discussing what Hawaii is doing at the United Nations, and I mentioned that we are speaking directly to many of the Pacific Island nations uh, who are our relatives and we, we are uh, we have shared many of the same values and all that, except for the fact that Hawaii had been separated from that family of nations uh, in the Pacific Islands and separated from the way that we do things. And so this is a, quite a discussion because 
we have been forced over the years to actually adopt uh, you, the U.S. way of doing things, the American way. And, and that has not really served us well because, in fact, it has been very destructive and, and uh, 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 difficult for us to deal with. But in my recent travels and, and in uh, travels, previous travels to the Pacific Islands, I realized that, you know, they're much freer in how they or organize their government and how they, uh, they conduct their, their affairs. And, and um, in talking with them, and there's been much published about this from, from the Pacific Islands, they started to use a term called the Pacific Way. And, and I thought about that and I said, okay, what is the Pacific Way? And, and there in evidence is, is how they function. They function like Pacific Islanders, even though they're part of the nations of the world. They've got international discourse going on, but they look at it through the lens of being Pacific Islanders. And this is a really refreshing thing uh, to experience, especially when everything here in Hawaii, in Hawaii is being looked at through the lens of an American uh, system. And so, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit more about the Pacific Way. And so, uh, you know, do you have some, some comments about that? Absolutely. Okay. Mahalo, Leon. Uh, this is something that I, too, am very passionate about. And so I'm very happy and thankful that we're speaking to this topic of Pacific Island Way. As you mentioned, through colonialism and through being a part of the United States, we are automatically sucked into a paradigm that is not necessarily consistent with us being Hawaiian. And when Hawaiians speak about what makes us Hawaiian, it is actually part and parcel of the Pacific way. However, I challenge all of you Hawaiians out there in our viewership to think about how we look at being Hawaiian and know that our genealogy, there's a smaller microcosm of our genealogy, your ohana, mm -hmm. my ohana, our larger Hawaii ohana as Kanaka. But as people of Hawaii, as Kanaka, as Owiwi, our immediate families are out there in Aotearoa, Rapanui, Tahiti, Tonga, Samoa, Tuvalu, Tokelau, and we could go on and name all of the islands of the Moana Nui. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, our family is, is found sprawling over the great Moana Nui. So Pacific Way, when we know about going to someone's house and what do we say hi my 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 aloha my kumo my hele my ai and we welcome somebody to eat mm -hmm. that's one very simple and one very common understanding of the pacific way um in other islands the word is talanoa it, it is akin to our word kukala or as uh olelo ni iha would say tutala and tutala means to speak or to proclaim but also tutala can be used in the way of talanoa. So tutala no kawa epili no te momea. Talanoa is an opportunity to have dialogue. Mm -hmm. Talk it, story. Yes, it's talk story. Yeah. Now in the talk story, I I think I be uh, I mentioned in another one of our episodes about Ho'oponopono and how I wasn't really a fan of Ho'oponopono. Mm -hmm. Um, Ho'oponopono has its purpose and its place, but instead of having to be retroactive about it and Ho'oponopono after you've done the damage, um, let's say you and I, uh, we speak on a topic and I feel one way, you feel another. Okay. In Pacific way or in more appropriate Hawaiian way, if we want to be specifically referring to us here in Hawaii, we have to be mindful of the fact that it's okay to have a difference of opinion. It's built into our culture. And our word is ho'opa'apa'a. Ho'opa'apa'a is oratory, debate, sometimes political dialogue and argument, um, discussions of the nature where you're going to go back and forth on issues. 
Now, this kind of ho'opa'apa concept um, is the precursor to needing a ho'oponopono. And if you've been mindful about how you engage people, you don't need to ho'oponopono. Aye, aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I'm not a fan of ho'oponopono because I believe that you know, we as a people have taken on such American ways and I'm always thinking about this. I encourage all of you to do the same. Are we really behaving in a Hawaiian manner or have we become either so American or perhaps such an infusion of other ethnicities, especially Asian culture? Now, I am Hawaiian Chinese and so yeah. I understand what this means. Um, there are certain things that are very particularly Asian and they go contradictory to Hawaiian, but many of my own family would not be able to discern the subtleties uh, and, and where it's appropriate and not. All of you out there in our viewership, think about what exactly is it that makes us Hawaiian and think about how that connects us to the Pacific. We cannot forget our history, our roots, and we cannot forget our family ties. And we're going to talk more about this yes. in our upcoming episode. So uh, thank you for helping us to bring this segment as a potential standing segment of which we will have more discussions on. But we look forward to bringing you more about the Pacific Island Way in our following episodes. As we just discussed, there are many things everyone can do now in the Pacific Way to help bring about a free Hawaii. They can range from small things like picking up trash at your favorite beach that you go to regularly, or to larger actions like helping to make sure that tourists and tourism do not go back to what it was before the pandemic, but rather evolves to what has been called smart tourism, where tourists actually learn about such things as aloha aina, the principles of kuleana, lokahi, kapu aloha, and other concepts that are a part of Kanaka way of life as well as Hawaii's history, which includes the illegal United States overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government and the reality that the Hawaiian Islands are still under a prolonged and belligerent illegal occupation by the United States. A great example of residents deciding to get involved in a Pacific way in Kuleana that can make a positive impact in their local community is a nonprofit group called Hana Highway Regulation on Maui. Hana Highway Regulation was formed in 2016 to help local government and the visitor industry address the impacts of tourism on the East Maui community. It's a civil volunteer group made up of 13 board members who are lineal descendants of East Maui. Hana Highway Regulation has facilitated town hall meetings, conducted traffic surveys, and more. In 2017, they established the Hana Highway Code of Conduct, and since then have actually been able to decrease the amount of unlicensed tour operators in East Maui. To tell us more, we go now to Maui, where Hana Highway Regulation Administrator and Community Coordinator Napua Hu'eu is standing by. Aloha aina kaawa e Napua. Welcome to Free Hawaii News. Aloha Hina, aloha Leon. Great to see you guys. Mahalo so much for hosting. Tell us Napua, how did Hana Highway Regulation get started? Hana Highway Regulation was started when the residents of East Maui noticed a rise in overcrowding, traffic hazards, visitor emergency rescue needs, um, the East Maui community came together with many of our veteran commercial ground tour operators to talk about these issues. Uh, some of the ground tour operators are very concerned with the rise of unlicensed commercial operators. These are illegal tour operators that facilitate activities and experiences along the road to Hana without the correct permits, licenses, insurances, and therefore they are alleviated from paying into state of Hawaii taxation. And now this causes economic impact for the state who cannot provide the maintenance for our highways, facilities, parks, et cetera. And it also causes an economic impact within our local economy as these illegal tour operators don't have as much of an overhead cost to operate. And so it causes some unfair, inequitable dynamics for our legal ground transportation tour providers who are paying into all of those 
permits, insurances, and licenses. So we came together in 2016 to talk about these issues. And from there, we've uh, started Hana Highway Regulation and have been at it ever since. Can you tell us about your visitor information personnel concept? Our visitor information personnel concept places generational residents from East Maui at the various hotspots that have been identified within East Maui. And hotspots are considered to be sites or attractions where visitors are coming to and therefore causing uh, traffic hazards through illegal parking, trespassing on private property, uh, which contributes to site degradation, uh, exploitation of our Vahipana or sacred sites. And our visitor information personnel concept is a way to help place uh, place specific intelligence at those locations to help uh, provide critical visitor information on site. Although the efforts of placing signs have been a great attempt by the state of Hawaii and the visitor industry. Uh, signs are not entirely effective. Uh, our data proves that visitors will knowingly openly disregard posted signage and that these mechanisms for management, such as you know, creating all of these pledges that visitors abide by the code of conduct uh, within our communities throughout Hawaii uh, have not been entirely effective. And so this visitor information personnel concept uh, has proven to decrease illegal parking, trespassing, and unlicensed commercial activity by up to 96% uh, when implemented with the appropriate training for residents. Has your organization brought more balance between residents and visitors in East Maui? And if so, how have you achieved that? Yes, our organization has been able to bring balance between the visitors and the residents in East Maui, and we've been able to achieve that through education, uh, working with the visitor industry to convey what our community guidelines are in East Maui and having them push that information out uh, through pre-arrival communications for inbound visitors. Uh, we've, we've also accomplished this by doing outreach with our visitor industry through hospitality staff training at the various resorts, uh, making sure that our valet and our concierge teams know what visitor conduct we expect here in East Maui. And we've also achieved this by providing resident training on effective visitor engagement. And so teaching our residents how to approach visitors, what tone to use when speaking to visitors, and what the critical terminology to employ when speaking to visitors is so that we can get our message across effectively. And oftentimes when residents are able to articulate um, the code of conduct that we're trying to get out of visitors and we articulate that in the right way, um, we are met with a positive and pono outcome on the visitor end. What does Hana Highway Regulation do to better protect Hawaii's cultural sites and especially Wahipana or sacred sites from being overrun and damaged by visitors? Many of our sacred sites or Vahipana are located on or beyond private property in East Maui. And so by implementing our visitor information personnel concept, we are able to prevent illegal parking and trespassing from happening, which thereby diminishes the site degradation that we're seeing at some of our sacred sites uh, here in East Maui. So by curbing the initial issue, we're able to alleviate the larger issues from transpiring, which is the site degradation, but also the emergency rescue needs. A lot of the helicopter you know, assistance that's required to get visitors out of questionable situations or emergency situations are diminished by making sure that we don't allow the visitors to illegally park and trespass to begin with. Another way that we protect Hawaii's or East Maui's cultural sites is through our web surveillance committee. We have a team of residents who monitor the social media channels and look for content that is exploitive of our sacred sites and sites that are located on or beyond private property. And we do engagement online with the social media influencers and the digital content creators, asking them 
to bring this content off of the internet and we provide all the reasons why they should do so, historical information, cultural information. And we have a decent success rate of being able to have um, these large scale influencers and famous uh, content creators bring down content that uh, exploits our cultural sites. And so that is another way that we uh, protect our cultural sites here in East Maui. Is it actually possible to decrease such things as tourist illegal parking, trespassing on private property, damage to cultural and sacred sites, and also do away with unlicensed commercial activity? Yes, it is possible to decrease illegal parking, trespassing, unlicensed commercial activity. Aside from the visitor information personnel concept of having place specific intelligence, generational residents on site to help provide visitor access to critical information. Uh, you could also take preliminary steps such as educational efforts, outreach efforts, and we have done this by getting our information out there, uh, laying out the rules for visiting East Maui or the optimal conduct that we expect from visitors in East Maui, uh, going out to the resorts and the activity booking providers and making sure that they're aware of this information, uh, making our code of conduct available online in many of different forms, uh, just through written form, video form, uh, making sure that it's easily accessible. We have also been able to achieve the decrease in illegal parking, trespassing, and unlicensed commercial activity by doing things ourselves, advocating that the Department of Transportation put up more no parking signs, which has helped to some degree over the last few years in curbing the illegal parking. Uh, we also made, painted, posted our own signs that help relay information about these various sites uh, we have also monitored the Hana Highway through traffic surveys and logged the illegal tour operators uh, through their license plates or the information that we gathered through engagement. And we were able to make phone calls as the Hana Highway Regulation Organization asking these various illegal tour operators to cease their activities. We provided this list of illegal tour operators to the Public Utilities Commission, which is the agency that oversees and regulates the motor carrier for hire industry so that they could hold these operators accountable because it is against the law to conduct such activities without the correct permits and licensing. And we also provided this list of illegal tour operators to the resorts who were unknowingly booking a lot of these illegal tour operators, uh, completely unaware that they didn't have the correct licenses to be conducting such activities. And so there are other steps besides uh, implementing the visitor information personnel concept right off the bat uh, that you can take to help uh, get a handle on the situation. Have you been able to partner or work with any of the tourism authorities here in Hawaii? The Maui Visitors and Convention Bureau has provided Han Highway Regulation the opportunity to provide presentations at various safety seminars that they have hosted for the hospitality industry staff, uh, where they gather employees from the resorts to educate them on the dynamics of what's going on in the communities and how they can better educate our visitors on optimal co uh, conduct. We have asked for fiscal support from my visitors and convention bureau and Hawaii Tourism Authority in the past, but to date we have yet to receive any fiscal support from the Visitors Bureau, the Hawaii Tourism Authority. We've done all of this by volunteer effort um, this is a resident funded and a resident employed operation uh, running on zero formal funding. Have you worked with local politicians at all? Our County of Maui, East Maui representative on the County Council, Shane Sinancy, has been very supportive of our efforts since he took office. He's provided us many of platforms to educate the council and the County of Maui about what's going on in East Maui so that we're able to share the articulation of impacts that are occurring. We have also seen Shane allocate 
portions of the County of Maui budget to support visitor management initiatives on Maui. We haven't been able to attain any of this funding as we are a civil volunteer organization. And so we never had the nonprofit status to be able to obtain this funding in the past, but we have uh, aligned with some fiscal sponsorship to be able to vie for those supports moving forward. Our former District 13 representative, Linda Clark, did pass Resolution 29 in the last legislative session, which identifies Hana Highway Regulation as a stakeholder to the task at hand of working with the Department of Transportation and the large landowners in East Maui to develop a holistic management plan for the Hana Highway to improve road safety for residents and visitors. So we were very grateful for Linda Clark in doing that and looping us into this important conversation and Kuleana at hand. Our current District 13 representative, Mahina Poipoi, is working with us to continue the conversations and planning for the objective of Resolution 29. And we are also working with her staff to curate future legislation that helps identify um, who would be at the helm of fiscal responsibility for some of the visitor management mechanisms that we have been developing over the year to help alleviate impacts in East Maui and better the Hana Highway in general. Can Hana Highway regulation create jobs for your local community? Yes, we are really adamant about our visitor information personnel concept being a way to create jobs within the visitor management sector that is developing here in the state of Hawaii. We are working diligently to help identify who would be at the helm of responsibility for funding this concept. And so we're working through that with our District 13 representative and her office. Now, Pua, how important is it for local communities on other islands to get involved in these issues on their respective islands? Because every ahupua'a throughout Hawaii is different, it requires a different approach in every ahupua'a. And so we're very adamant about all of our various communities identifying the issues that are occurring and also talking through and developing the solutions as well. We spent a long time not only doing traffic surveys, but all types of data collection at the various hotspots that are occurring uh, tourism impacts um, to be able to identify the culprits of the issues. And we also spent a lot of time going door to door and facilitating town hall style meetings in East Maui to help gather community input and gauge what type of solutions are already out there in our community that we have been considering for a long time and put that all together to help expedite these solutions for the local government, state of Hawaii, county of Maui, and our visitor industry as well. Can anyone interested use your model or template to create something like this in their communities? On a few occasions, the local government and the visitor industry did try to employ visitor management techniques that they saw in other parts of the nation, other parts of the world. And we feel that it's very important to harness place-specific intelligence when developing solutions to help avoid waste of time and taxpayer monies. We've seen a lot of failed trial and error uh, when the state of Hawaii tries to employ solutions that are not derived by the community itself. So we do think it's very important that our communities identify their issues, curate their solutions, and advocate relentlessly that they be supported by the state of Hawaii and the visitor industry here in Hawaii. I highly recommend looking at our website as an inspirational template for other communities who feel the need to address tourism impacts that may be occurring in their area. On our website, we have a page that documents our timeline, all the steps that we took to uh, formalize our advocacy for solutions to be employed here in East Maui. Uh, we highly recommend that the communities across Hawaii uh, reach out to us if they need kokua. We did 
go over to Kauai to consult with the Wainiha Ha'ena community and also the Honaunau Ahupua'a on Hawaii Island. And so we're more than happy to help uh, give input if anybody is considering taking this route to um, better their home. So what would you say to someone who wants change but is still sitting on the sidelines? Only we as the individuals here in Hawaii can free Hawaii. And so I think that it's important that everybody uh, awamo the kuleana in their area and do what they can to better the conditions of their communities. Um, if we had not taken action in 2016, uh, I could only imagine how far behind we would be as far as generating support, attention, acknowledgement for these impacts that are occurring uh, in East Maui. So I highly encourage everybody to take the initiative sooner than later. If we all do what we know best, then I believe we can move Hawaii along to be that Hawaii that we all envision. No leila mahalo anu ya o e na pua no ko kipa anamai ya mau a manei ma free Hawaii news mahalo anu i ko mau manao aloha mahalo anu for joining us for this episode of free Hawaii news it's been a pleasure to have you and we hope you've enjoyed all the presenters we thank you very much for watching us no leila e ka lei ho he no ho yo kala hui mahalo anu i ko ka ko hui ana mahalo no ki kipa anamai a uh, o ma ono ke ma free Hawaii news a uh, hui ho kako aloha. aloha. We hope you enjoyed this month's episode of Free Hawaii News. Mahalo for watching. There's a new show every month, so this program will air several more times this month. You can view it anytime on Olelo's on-demand site or on YouTube. See you next time. Ahui ho, aloha aina.